Hello, hello everyone! My name is John Sierra and I am a Tolkien scholar. That means I'm the guy that you can come to with all your questions about the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, whether it's The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or The Silmarillion or any of his other books or even questions about him. And uh, yeah, we've been doing this YouTube channel for a little bit over a year now and we have been accepted into the partnership program, which is really exciting, and that means that you can join as a member if you'd like. Joining as a member is a paid subscription, and I'm going to just kind of briefly give you a rundown on what that means uh, for you and for me before saying that, of course, you don't have to join if you don't want to. If you just want to subscribe and watch the videos, that is great, but as I am not yet at the level where I can get ad revenue yet, I need a thousand subscribers for that, it is important for me to push memberships a bit. So I'm going to do a separate video sometime real soon that's going to explain it in greater detail, but what do you get as a member? If you join the channel, which there's a join button you'll see on the screen, you will get a special badge put next to your name. It is a really cool badge that I made that is the G rune that Gandalf uses to, um, to sign his name. And uh, as you rack up more and more months of membership, it will evolve. After six months, there will be a little moon icon. After a year, there will be a sun icon. And then it can go up to four suns. And it actually looks really cool. And that's your loyalty badge. You'll also get some cool emotes that I made, and there will be more to come as we get more memberships. We have a One Ring emote, we have a uh, Eye of Sauron emote, and we have a Silmaril emote, and I will be making more. Uh, that was like all I could make for the time being. Or like I wait make one more, but that's all I had the time to make is what I'm getting at. But here is the biggest thing you We'll get to see all the videos early. You'll also be shouted out in each video towards the end. There's going to be a screen that's going to show all the current members. If you joined and you don't see yourself on the membership list, keep in mind that these are now being made a week in advance. That gives my editor plenty of time to edit the video and put it up. But just to let you guys know where we're at with it, um, Currently, the videos are going to be scheduled. They're always going to be up at the same time now, not at random times, but they're going to be up at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, that's, that's U.S. time, on Wednesdays. However, just to let you know that um, last week's episode, episode 51, How Powerful Was Ungoliant, that was actually uploaded, let's see... Well, just, this just says when it was scheduled, but it was available, I think, um, Saturday, Saturday night or sometime during Sunday. So you'll get to see the videos a lot earlier than anybody else. Um, they're, so basically what the editor is doing is editing everything and uploading it and then um, setting it to members only and then scheduling it to go live to everyone else Wednesday at 7 p.m. So if you want to see several days before it may vary exactly when it goes up but it is always going to be several days before it is available to anyone else you can uh, join also um, another thing about joining that's great is all your comments will be highlighted so there's that so anyway let's get into our reading and I decided I want to do a little bit of the two towers here the two towers being the second part of the Lord of the Rings and um, I wanted to read a bit of a part with Faramir. And the reason I wanted to is because it's something that comes up a lot is uh, the nature of Faramir as a character and Boromir's brother and everything. And unfortunately, I had a discussion with a friend of mine. It's not unfortunate that I had a discussion with a friend. But I had a discussion with a friend of mine where he was talking about the Lord of the Rings with a friend of his. And uh, the question that was asked of him was... What is the change that Peter Jackson made in the films that you dislike the most? And he was talking about the beginning of the film, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, where it shows Sauron sort of reaching for Isildur instead of using his weapon. Um, and that it was just kind of, it didn't make a lot of sense, it didn't fit the lore and everything. That was his least favorite part of the movie, in, sen in sense of a change that was made. And mine, I, I said, he said, what's yours? I said, here's mine. And I just posted a picture of Faramir because they really ruined this character from the movie. And what drives me crazy is a lot of the dialogue that was used was from the book, but the context was very different. The tone was very different. Even the venue was very different. So to set this up, um, this is after Frodo and Sam have first met Faramir and they have been brought to Faramir's hideout. They were not 
captured or arrested or detained. They were not tied up. They were blindfolded because the location of the hideout was a secret. And uh, they are sitting down to eat a meal with Faramir and discussing things. And this is the scene where Faramir finds out about the One Ring and you see how he's going to react to it. Let's see. <clears throat> I'm not reading the entire conversation because it is long, but I'm kind of going towards the part where he, uh, he finds out about the ring. You don't say much in all your tales about the elves, sir, said Sam, suddenly plucking up courage. He had noted that Faramir seemed to refer to elves with reverence, and this even more than his courtesy and his food and wine had won Sam's respect and quieted his suspicions. No, indeed, Master Samwai, said Faramir, for I am not learned in elven lore. But there you touch upon another point in which we have changed, declining from Numenor to Middle-earth. For, as you may know, the, if Mithrandir was your companion, and you have spoken with Elrond, the Edain, the fathers of the Numenorians, fought beside the elves in the first wars, and, re and were rewarded by the gift of the kingdom in the midst of the sea, within sight of Elvenholm. But in Middle-earth, men and elves became estranged in the days of darkness by the arts of the enemy, and by the slow changes of time, in which each kind walked further down their sundered roads. Men now fear and misdoubt the, el the elves, and yet know little of them. And we of Gondor grow like other men, like the men of Rohan, for even they who are foes of the Dark Lord shun the elves and speak of the Golden Wood with dread. Yet there are among us still some who have dealings with the elves when they may, and ever and anon, one will go in secret to Lorien, seldom to return. Not I, for I deem it perilous now for mortal man to willfully seek out the elder people. Yet I envy you that you have spoken with the White Lady. The Lady of Lorien, Galadriel, cried Sam. You should see her indeed, you should, sir. I am only a hobbit, and gardening's my job at home, sir, if you'll understand me, and I'm not much good at poetry, not at making it. a bit of a comic rhyme, perhaps, now and again, you know, but not real poetry, so I can't tell you what I mean, it ought to be sung. You'd have to get Strider, Aragorn, that is, or old Mr. Bilbo for that. But I wish I could make a song about her. Beautiful she is, sir, lovely. Sometimes like a great tree in flower, sometimes like a white daffodown dilly, small and slender-like, hard as diamonds, soft as moonlight, warm as sunlight, cold as frost in the stars, proud and far off as a snow mountain, and merry as any lass I ever saw with daisies in her hair in springtime. But that's a lot of nonsense and all wide of my mark. Then she must be lovely indeed, said Faramir, perilously fair. Well, I don't know about perilous, said Sam. It strikes me that folk take their peril with them in DeLorean and finds it there because they've brought it. But perhaps you could call her perilous because she's so strong in herself. You, you could dash yourself to pieces on her like a ship on a rock or drown yourself like a hobbit in a river. But neither rock nor river would be to blame. Now, Bor... He stopped and went red in the face. Yes, now Boromir, you would say, said Faramir. What would you say? He took his peril with him. Yes, sir, begging your pardon, and a fine man as your brother was, if I may say so, but you've been warm on the scent all along. Now I watched Boromir and listened to him from Rivendell all the way down the road, looking after my master, as you'll understand, and not meaning any harm to Boromir. And it's my opinion, and in Lorien, he first saw clearly what I guessed sooner, what he wanted. From the moment he first saw it, he wanted the enemy's ring. Sam! cried Frodo, aghast. He had fallen asleep. I'm sorry. He had fallen deep into his own thoughts for a while, and came out of them suddenly and too late. Save me, said Sam, turning white, and then flushing scarlet. There I go again. Whenever you open your big mouth, you put your foot in it, the old gaffer used to say to me, and right enough, oh dear, oh dear. Now look here, sir. He turned, facing up to Faramir with all the courage that he could muster. Don't you go taking advantage of my master because his servant's no better than a fool. You've spoken very handsome all along. Put me off my guard, talking of elves and all, but handsome is as handsome does, we say. Now's a chance to show your quality. So it seems, said Faramir, slowly and very softly, with a strange smile. So that is the answer to all the riddles, the one ring that was thought to have perished from the world. And Boromir tried to take it by force, and you escaped, and ran all the way to me. And here in the wild I have you, two halflings, and a host of men at my call, and the Ring of Rings. A pretty stroke of fortune. A chance for Faramir, captain of Gondor, to show his quality. Ha! He stood up very tall and stern, his eyes glinting. 
Frodo and Sam sprang from their stools and set themselves side by side with their backs to the wall, fumbling for their sword hilts. There was a silence. All the men in the cave stopped talking and looked towards them in wonder. But Faramir sat down again in his chair and began to laugh quietly, and then suddenly became grave again. Alas for Boromir. It was too sore a trial, he said. How you have increased my sorrow, you two strange wanderers from a far country, bearing the peril of men. But you are less judges of men than I of halflings. We are truth speakers, we men of Gondor. We boast seldom, and then perform or die in the attempt. Not if I found it on the highway would I take it, I said. Even if I were such a man as to desire this thing. And even though I knew not clearly what this thing was when I spoke, I still should take those words as a vow and be held by them. But I am not such a man. Or I am wise enough to know that there are some perils from which a man should flee. Sit at peace, and be comforted, Samwise, if you seem to have stumbled. Think that it was fated to be so. Your heart is shrewd as well as faithful, and saw clearer than your eyes. For strange though it may seem, it was safe to declare this to me. It may even help the master that you love. It shall turn to his good if it is in my power. So be comforted, but do not even name this thing again aloud. Once is enough. So obviously he doesn't drag them off to Osgiliath and then wanting to bring the ring and Frodo to, to Denethor and Minas Tirith and prove that he's really the good son that Denethor doesn't believe he is. And the whole thing with Denethor not really liking Faramir is very much an invention of the films. He did say that he wished, in the book, he did say that he wished that Faramir had gone to Rivendell instead of Boromir. And I think Peter Jackson read this part and misunderstood it and thought that it meant that Denethor wished that Faramir had gone because he would rather Faramir had died and Boromir lived rather than Boromir having died and, and Faramir having lived because he just loves Boromir so much and he just doesn't really like Faramir. And he does seem to come down a little harshly on Faramir at times in the book, um, but it's because that Boromir died and suddenly Faramir, the younger brother, is next in line to be the steward, so suddenly there's a lot of pressure on him. And I've always believed that by saying that he wished that Faramir had gone to Rivendell rather than Boromir, that it was not because he wished that Faramir would have died, but because he knew that Faramir would have survived, that he would be that he was wiser than his brother. He was not mightier than him, but he was smarter than him, he was kinder than him, he was wiser than him. He was much a man like his father Denethor himself, or Boromir was kind of a meathead, if I'm being honest. Anyway, we're going to get down into your questions. We have 16 questions to get to this week, so uh, away we go. Okay, so this first question comes in from Alex2, who asks, Assuming companies could get the rights to all of Tolkien's books, do you think a First Age story like The Fall of Gondolin or Children of Hurin could be done in a one-shot movie, or do you prefer it to be serialized, like a TV show? So, my personal preference is standalone stories of the great tales. Uh, the Silmarillion is not exactly a smooth narrative, but there are lots of stories in there that would support excellent standalone films. The Children of Hurin, Beren and Luthien, The Fall of Gondolin, and The Fall of Numenor, the so-called... Uh, the Fall of Numenor Second Age, but the so-called Great Tales. They would all make excellent standalone movies, uh, but there's also room for more movies in that, say, sort of a Silmarillion trilogy, something like Flight of the Noldor being the first part, The War of the Jewels being the second part, and The War of Wrath being the final part. I don't think a TV show is the right way to go with this particular material, uh, because while it's all interconnected, of course, there's enough good standalone stories to make um, more than a few great films, if if it ever comes to that, uh, that a company does get all the rights and that they do want to do it properly and that they do want to really make it shine, it could be done really wonderfully. Okay, next question. Okay, so this one came in from Evangelos Paschopoulos. I hope I said it right. I think I nailed it. 
Was Tur still alive by the end of the War of the Ring? Is anything known about his whereabouts or his later life? Um, so there are a lot of people who would love to point out from this question that it was sung about by the elves that Tur was uniquely made an exception to the doom of man, and he was made immortal and, and counted among the Eldar, but only sung. It wasn't definitive. That's what a lot of people like to say. They will point to Tolkien's letter 153, that it was supposed not stated. That's Tolkien's exact words. It was supposed not stated. So once again, even the author in this case is saying that Tour's immortality was only supposed and it wasn't actually stated in the text. So how can I say that he was definitely still alive in the Third Age? Because that's what I'm going to say. Tolkien kind of slipped up, in my opinion, in this letter. If you continue to read letter 153, you're going to get to this part. I'm going to read you a brief part of letter 153. Immortality and mortality being the specific gifts of God to the Eruhini, in whose conception and creation the Valar had no part at all, it must be assumed that no alteration of their fundamental kind could be affected by the Valar, even in one case. The cases of Luthien and Tur, and the position of their descendants, was a direct act of God. The entering into men of the elven strain is indeed represented as a part of a divine plan for the ennoblement of the human race from the beginning destined to replace the elves. So the letter, uh, letter 153, was curiously never sent. Tolkien stated that he felt that it was too self-important and he never sent it. So the intended recipient, which was Peter Hastings, never got the letter, but it was published, of course, after Tolkien's death. While Tolkien stated that it was too self-important, it is interesting, though, to see how earlier in the letter he kind of plays it a little bit coy with the facts. It's supposed, not stated, we're not really sure what happened, you know. It's up to reader interpretation, essentially. But then later on, when comparing Tour to his mirror counterpart Luthien, the elf who became mortal, without having any mortal ancestry, as Tur was the man who became immortal without having any elvish ancestry, they are the same. They're going in opposite directions across doom. And Tolkien here explicitly states that it was God, or Iluvatar, who made this happen. Personally, I harbor a suspicion that Tolkien realized that he may have said too much in this letter, and that might have been a contributing factor in not sending it. He even states that it was God's divine plan for the elves and the men to intermarry. So Tur was definitely made immortal, and therefore he was very much alive during the War of the Ring. As for what he's doing, probably whatever he felt like doing. But considering that almost all of the heroes of the Third Age have either a direct or an indirect connection to him, he, I think, would be watching all of these events with pride, maybe giving Olmo a high five every now and then. So, here you have it. Next question. Okay, so this question came in from William Holm, who asks, Sauron underestimated the effects of the One Ring's destruction, not prioritizing its recovery, even believing it could be destroyed with little harm done. How could the Council of Elrond then know his defeat was certain if the ring was destroyed? So first off, I, I had to apologize to um, Mr. Holm here who wrote this question because when you, when you ask somebody a question on Korra, you can directly ask a specific person a question, but anybody else can still answer, of course. And he got a few answers that got to it before I did, and they were... Not only were they wrong, but they were kind of, I, I think, very unkind and kind of rude because a lot of people missed that part in The Fellowship of the Ring where Gandalf tells Frodo that Sauron thought that the ring had been destroyed long ago, but now he knows that it is not. And later on, everybody just gets it in their head that there's no way that Sauron could have thought that because look at what happened to him. But he doesn't know that that's what's going to happen to him. And the person who wrote the question, Mr. William Holm, actually kind of gets it, but doesn't understand other aspects of it. But I wanted to sort of apologize for the fact that everybody else on Quora kind of jumped down your throat a little bit on this one um, and told you that you were wrong. A lot of people just said, no, you're wrong, but you're not wrong. You're actually correct. So Sauron 
definitely underestimated the effects of the ring's destruction, at least until he met Gollum. Now keep in mind, this information did not come up during the Council of Elrond, but months earlier, in Bag End when Gandalf was speaking to Frodo. Gandalf states that Sauron had thought the ring already destroyed, as should have been done long ago. But now, he realizes that it has not been destroyed. Now, upon realizing that his ring was not only not destroyed, but that it was kicking around in the hands of someone named Baggins, he now knew far more about it than he ever had before. Sauron poured most of his power into the ring, and he was in rapport with his power. Putting the power into the ring did not make him weaker, is what that means. And being separated from the ring does not make him weaker. But at one point, he was a lot weaker. And he may have, in this moment, thought that this weakness that he was experiencing was due to the destruction of the One Ring by the Elves. And he may have falsely believed that he could recover his power after the One's destruction, which we know is not the case. But that doesn't mean that Sauron knew that that was not the case. The reason for his weakness, though, was because he lost two bodies in a relatively short time period he was smacked around by Elendil and Gilgalad when he was not yet through recovering from the Akalabeth, basically taking a biblical level cataclysm right to the face. So Sauron was pretty beat up and the one had passed out of memory in history, so he, he believed it was gone. The likes of, of Gandalf and, and Elrond are wiser than Sauron. They know that the One Ring is something that must be destroyed. Not merely because it will eventually end up in Sauron, you know, not merely because it will end his threat, but because he they cannot keep it safe from him forever. It's eventually going to wind up in his hands somehow. So Sauron, of course, was he was arrogant. He had seen what the ring had done to Gollum. He was a little creeped out by it, but he thought at this point it must be impossible for someone to actually destroy it. So he was not worried about that anymore. Keep in mind that there were other ideas that were floated at the Council of Elrond, including giving the ring to, to Tom Bombadil or just chucking it into the sea. My very first episode, the thumbnail question was about why don't they just chuck the ring into the sea? But Gandalf saw a unique opportunity to make sure that Sauron could never ever recover it. What would actually happen to Sauron wasn't exactly known, but Gandalf figured out that the Dark Lord would be, in his own words, brought low, and he was correct. We see a similar doubt with Galadriel. Elrond states that no one knows what effect the One Ring's destruction will have on the three, the Elven Rings, and they were not made by Sauron. They were made by Celebrimbor, and Sauron wasn't around for that, and he never touched them. But they were made using Sauron's magic, Sauron's knowledge, and they were still bound to the one. It was the one ring to rule them all, not the one ring to rule a few. So while there were people in the story that believed that the three would be freed and no longer bound and that they would be able to be used, some like Elrond believed that they would lose their power. And this doubt that Galadriel also had that her ring might lose its power is why she considered taking up the one ring herself. Of course she didn't, but she did consider it for a bit. Okay, next question. Okay, so in The Lord of the Rings, what happens to the hobbits living in the Gladden Fields where Smeagol slash Gollum was from during the Fourth Age, during the Fourth Age, considering that they were not part of the Shire and inside the borders of Gondor and Arnor and under its rule? So, unfortunately, they were gone. Uh, how long they were gone for is sort of up a, a, for debate, but they were definitely gone. These river folk, they, they were Smeagol's people, and they were basically stores, which is a type of hobbit. They were re-migrant stores. They had once lived in Arthedain, like most hobbits, but found the Shire and Breeland not to their liking. And keep in mind that the Shire is also part of... Uh, Aragorn's realm as well, because it's, it's part of Arthedain, which is a part of Arnor, but um, he of course proclaimed it a free land. So they, they didn't like 
living there, so they went back to their point of origin, adopting a more primitive lifestyle. Now, this doesn't mean that Gollum ever lived in the Shire or near the Shire, just that his people once did, and then they re-migrated back to where they had sort of come from. So there are two versions of what happens to them, and both of these involve the store is being gone. Now, in Unfinished Tales, we are told that when the Nazgul came to Isengard looking for the location of the Shire, Saruman lied to them and told them that it was in the Vales of the Anduin, which is the Gladden Fields. This was indeed a hobbit dwelling, though Saruman was well aware of the location of the, the actual Shire, but he lied. He didn't want Sauron to obtain the One Ring. He wanted the One Ring for himself. And uh, he suspected that the One Ring was somehow tied up with Gandalf and the Hobbits. So, what did the Nazgul discover when they went to the Vales of the Anduin, where Hobbits supposedly lived? In one version of the story, they found nothing. Just the remnants of old settlements that had long since been abandoned. Uh, suggesting that the stores that live there either died out or they just moved on to who knows where. Um, in another version, though, there were still Sturish hobbits living there in this location, and they were all killed by the Nazgul. Okay, next question. Why do they travel by foot in the Lord of the Rings? Uh, to put it simply, they're not using roads. That's the big part of it. Many people forget, uh, with months and years being between, you know, now and the last time that they read the book, that the quest of the Fellowship was very stealthy, and it needed to be that way. They didn't wish either Sauron or, or Saruman to know what they were up to, and this involved moving in secret. This meant no roads, because the roads were watched. It was too obvious. So they cut straight south from Rivendell across wild countryside with no settlements, no roads, and that means no horses. Uh, you could take horses across terrain like that, but it's, it's dangerous and it would slow you down. Um, using horses effectively means that you have to take roads, or, you know, if you are going across wild, untamed lands, you would have to be a very experienced rider, which is not a problem for the likes of Boromir or Aragorn or Legolas or Gandalf, but a big problem for Gimli and the Hobbits. It would also double their provisions, and of course, thundering hooves and the dust clouds inherent to horseback riding are a lot more conspicuous than walking. They also would not be able to bring the horses into Mordor. Um, in, I'm sorry, into Mordor. Into Moria is what I meant to say. They wouldn't be able to bring the horses into to Mordor either, but they wouldn't get them that far. They wouldn't be able to bring horses through Moria uh, because horses just wouldn't go into Moria. It's just not going to happen. So they would either have to abandon them or they would have to not go through Moria and go through the Gap of Rohan and basically ride right by Saruman's front door, which would have been bad, of course. Okay, next question. In The Lord of the Rings, does Arwen become mortal or is she immortal? She is able to choose to live a mortal life, but what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that she's capable of dying? Does the story of Luthien explain anything? Um, so she does indeed become mortal. She makes the choice of Luthien, and that's in her own words. Uh, Luthien's mortality was gifted to her by Iluvatar. We touched on this a little bit earlier when speaking about Tur. She had to become mortal in order to revive her love, Beren, who was mortal, and he had died from wounds from the battle with the great werewolf Karcharoth. So Beren and Luthien were now both mortal, and they lived out the rest of their natural lives apart from others. Their son, Dior, was a mortal as well. Though like his father, he also wound up wedding an immortal elf, a lady named Nimloth. So Dior and Nimloth had a daughter named Elwing, and she was a Perithel, which means half-elf. But she was mortal, because any amount of mortal ancestry would make you mortal at this point. So 
Elwing wound up marrying uh, Yarendil, and he was another mortal Parathal. He was the son of Tur, who was a mortal man, or at least he started off as a mortal man, and Idril, who was an immortal elf. So Yarendil and Elwing did something that was both forbidden and thought to be impossible. They sailed to the west. They went to the Undying Lands. They were not allowed to do this because they were mortal, and it was also thought to be impossible because the Valar had put a veil of mist and confusion around the Undying Lands. Nobody could find it. However, Yarendil held with him a Silmaril, and the light from it, which was the same as the light of Valinor, helped him to navigate to Amon, and he came to Valinor. Manwe told him that they would be allowed to stay, as they had come for a good purpose to try and rally forces against Morgoth, and they had elvish ancestry. But they must choose between mortality and immortality, and this choice would wind up being given to any of their descendants who were Perithel. So their twin sons, Elrond and Elros, had to choose as well. Elros chose to be mortal, and he became the first king of Numenor, and as he married a mortal, the choice was not given to his descendants, though they did live for a very, very long time. Elrond chose immortality. Elrond and his wife, Calabrian, had a, three children, Eladan, Elrohir, and Arwen. Now, they have two immortal parents because Elrond was an immortal Parathel. So they were all considered immortal Parathel. Though they had the ability to forsake their mortality. We don't know what Arwen's brothers chose, but we do know that Arwen did indeed choose mortality to be with Aragorn and to not sail to the west. She died a year after Aragorn. She laid down her life in the empty fields of Lothlarien, and therefore she followed Aragorn into the mortal afterlife. Okay, next question. What is the age difference between Aragorn and other characters such as Gandalf, Gimli, and Legolas in The Lord of the Rings? Um, so I'll actually, I'll actually tell you the age difference between him and the whole Fellowship. Um, Aragorn is 87 years old when Frodo meets him in Bree, and by the end of the, the story, when he becomes the king, he's 88. Um, of course, he doesn't appear to be a guy who's pushing 90, but as a Dúnedain, which is a man of Númenor, and a direct descendant of Elros the, the Perithel, the half-elf, he has a longer lifespan than most men, though he it was diminished from the prime of the Dúnedain. He's not going to live to be 400, 500 years old. He lived to be 210 years old. So to compare him to the rest of the Fellowship, the, the oldest would be Gandalf. He's eternal. He predates the existence of the universe. Then there's Legolas. Now, Legolas's age is never actually disclosed. We, we don't know his birth date. Um, but as an adult elf, he is at least 100 years old, and he's likely older than that, probably somewhere in the 2,000 to 3,000 year range, because he refers to the Fellowship uh, as children, jokingly, of course. Gimli is 139, which for a dwarf is in the prime of his life. Frodo is 50. He's the oldest of the hobbits. Boromir was 41. Sam is 38. Merry is 36. And Pippin is the youngest. He's 28. And he's actually considered underage by Hobbit standards. He's the, the youngest one. He's not a full adult because Hobbits come of age at 33, which is kind of a little bit why Gandalf was having a little bit of a hard time with him being there. Not because he disliked him or because he was so annoying, but that he really thought he really shouldn't be there. But of course, Gandalf came around on that. Okay, next question. So this is actually not a question about, about Tolkien or about The Lord of the Rings, but we're going to get into it. Ogo, named after Drogo Baggins. Um... So full disclosure here, I know very little about the series of Song of Ice and Fire, and I don't care to. I got a few chapters into the first book, the one that was called A Game of Thrones, and then I decided that I had other things to do. I never watched the TV show, um, but I am aware that there's a character named Khal Drogo. So anyway, because I'm the Tolkien guy, I'm the Lord of the Rings guy, I'm the Tolkien scholar, um, 
that's why I chose to answer this because I, I normally would pass on any question that comes from George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire and people do ask me questions about it all the time and I don't answer them because I don't know. I don't know the answers really. I read like maybe maybe four or five chapters of the first book and I gave up um, and I never watched the TV show. But this piqued my curiosity because the, yeah, there is a character named Cal Drogo and I never made that connection before between Cal Drogo and Drogo Baggins who is Frodo Baggins' father. So I did the sensible thing and I just Googled it. And it turns out that yeah, Cal Drogo is indeed named after Drogo Baggins. Um, I learned from what I read online that Kal is a title and his name is just Drogo and George R. R. Martin was of course a big fan of the Lord of the Rings and he did specifically name Drogo after Drogo Baggins. Uh, he did admit that that is where he got the name from. Now imagine though if instead of picking Frodo's father he picked Bilbo's father, and then we would all be talking about a character named Calbungo. And then when I told that joke to my friend Sid Kemp, he said, er, or his wife, Calabungo. And I was like, what are you, a Ninja Turtle? All right, but next question. This universe, would a male who is half elf and half human be classified as an elf or a human? So I, I, I did touch on this a bit before. They're called the Perithel, which means half-elf. So a Perithel is anyone who has elvish and mannish blood. This normally would make you mortal. Any drop of mortal blood makes you mortal, but there have been exceptions. The Arundel and Elwing were both Perithel that were made by the Valar to choose their doom. Mortality, passing from the circles of the world onto an unknown path to an afterlife, or immortality, where you're bound to the world until its conclusion. They both chose immortality. This meant that their Perithel children, Elrond and Elros, had to choose, and I kind of went over that all already. But under normal circumstances, where there is not a choice given, any product of a man and an elf joining together and having a child, the result are going to be mortal children, and they are called Perithel. Next question. If the rangers of Dunedain were supposed to be guarding the borders of the Shire, how did the Nine get past them? So this is a, this is a good question. You don't hear this one too often because we learn later in the story uh, that Aragorn's men, the rangers of the north of Dunedain, were guarding the Shire. And then you might start to think, well, how did the, how did the Black Riders get in there? Well, actually, they, they fought the rangers. According to uh, the Return of the King Appendix B, the Nazgul did meet up with the rangers and they fought. And this is why not all nine black riders were in the Shire. Some of them engaged with the rangers and drove them off into the east, while others broke off and went into the Shire. The nine remained split up like this until they came together right as Frodo was riding to the ford of Bruinen. Uh, and I, there was a person that requested that, but I am not going to try to pronounce the name. It's, it's, I, I'm not going to try. I'm very sorry. I, I can't pronounce that. Okay. Next question. Are the children of the exiled Noldor that are born in Beleriand also considered exiles themselves? Uh, yes, yes, they were. Uh, it, it was more of a practical necessity than anything else, though. Um, to prevent the Noldor, who were exiled, uh, from returning to Aman, the Valar put a veil over the Undying Lands. A mist and confusion. No ship will find the Undying Lands. This is sort of an overreaction, if we're being honest. It prevents not just the Noldor from finding the Undying Lands, but any of the Elves, uh, the Sindar, the Sylvan, even the Avari, if they change their minds, uh, they might get the sea longing and be filled with the urge to sail to the West, and they can't. Um, it's basically a blanket ban on anybody from Middle-earth coming to the Undying Lands through the sea, just to punish a few. 
So Iarandil, I mentioned earlier, managed to get there with his wife Elwing. He used a Silmiril to navigate through the Vale. He was welcomed by Manwe, and of course we mentioned the whole thing, that they had to choose their doom and everything. Um, but one thing that I didn't get into, because it wasn't as relevant, was that Namo Mandos raised the issue that they were mortal, and they're not supposed to be there. Um, and Manwe said, well, they have Elvish ancestry, so we'll make an exception in this case. But then Namo Mandos said, but the Noldor are banned from sailing west. Now, it's not the greatest argument that he's making. One could say that Iarandil had a Noldo mother, but Elwing's Elvish ancestry wasn't Noldor at all. It was Sindar. So why would she be banned? And why would Iarandil be banned? He was born in Middle-earth. He didn't have any part of the rebellions. He didn't have any part in any kin slayings. So I think the Valar at this point had to realize that this this total ban was unfair and not as practical as they thought it was, which is why after the subsequent War of Wrath, they lifted the blanket ban. Instead, they only singled out certain specific elves as exiles. Next question. Okay, so here's the one from the thumbnail. Is there any evidence of a romantic relationship between Sauron and Galadriel in The Lord of the Rings? Um, so I know where this comes from. Of course, there was the Amazon TV show where there's sort of this flirtatious relationship between Galadriel and a character who turns out later to be Sauron. And um, not only that, but he sort of still seems to be interested in her even after he's exposed. In the books, there's no evidence that they ever even met each other. Um, I don't think Galadriel ever met Sauron. Now, I know that people have strong opinions about the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power on Amazon. I watched the first season. I've talked about my opinion that it's okay. Uh, it's it's not like the worst show I've seen. It, it's not like... It, there's room for improvement, obviously. Um, but I think that some people who feel very strong about it sort of do this thing that um, I don't think is very smart. They make disliking the show almost their whole personality. Like, I could be talking about... Uh, uh, something linguistic or, or, or something about Elrond or or, or just to answering a question about a Balrog or Gandalf or something. And then these people will just come into the comments section, uh, not on YouTube, but on, on Quora, and just start complaining about the TV show. And I'm like, guys, nobody's talking about the TV show. What what are you here for? What, why, why are you looking for every Tolkien-related thing to make comments about it? It's just, it's tiresome after a while. I think it's toxic too. But when you like, if you don't like the show, that's cool. Not a lot of people. Um, well, I won't say not a lot of people like. A lot of people do like it, but there are a lot of people that don't like it, and there are a lot of people that like it. And I think that it's kind of messed up that people will not get along over something so silly as a TV show. I mean, the only video in my entire series of answering Tolkien questions that has less than a ninety percent like to dislike ratio is the one where I said that I don't absolutely hate the Rings of Power. Um, I didn't hate it. And and uh, I'm going to eventually analyze and react to the entire show on this channel. Um, and yes, I'm going to pull apart all the things that are wrong and everything. But that doesn't mean that we can't derive some, some pleasure from something that is very simply fan fiction. You know? And if you don't like it, that's cool too. You don't have to like it. You can even hate it. You could think it's the worst show ever. But like I said, don't make it your whole personality. I just wanted to bring that up because in The Rings of Power, Galadriel met Sauron. Uh, she was unaware that he was Sauron until the final episode of season one uh, where she uncovered and exposed him. Now, Sauron, of course, does this whole thing where he tries to seduce her, come rule by my side. And of course, she's just like, no, firm reject hard no now the show is fan fiction i mentioned that it was never meant to be canon unfortunately no one has the rights to make any kind of movie or tv show based on the silmarillion or its satellite stories or unfinished tales which brings us back to the the first question we answered they nobody has the rights to make that so in telling a story from the second age they can only base it off of 
what is mentioned in the Lord of the Rings and its appendices and the Hobbit as well. Anything beyond that is original story. So in the books, did anything like that happen? No, of course not. Sauron came to the Elvish kingdom of Lindon. He called himself Anatar, and he was rejected by Gilgalad and Elrond. Uh, and then he went to Eregion, where he was welcomed by Celebrimbor. Now, I have seen many, many references that people make. Even my fellow Tolkien scholars will say that Galadriel distrusted him when he came to Eregion. It's even in one of the Tolkien wikis, and the good wiki, believe it or not, the one that's called the Tolkien Gateway. And I'm going to read you just the, the blurb from Tolkien Gateway where it summarizes this part of the story. It says, Elsewhere Anatar was gladly received, especially in Eregion, where only Galadriel distrusted him. The Noldoran smiths there learned much from him in art and magic, as their thirst for knowledge was great. So... This bizarre claim, this unsourced claim, actually has no merit. Galadriel was not in Eregion at the time. She was already in Lothlorien. In the Silmarillion, it does not mention Galadriel at all in this part of the story. And I'm going to read you the relevant part of the Silmarillion. Men he found the easiest to sway of all the peoples of the earth, but long he sought to persuade the elves to his service, for he knew that the firstborn had the greater power, and he went far and wide among them, and his hue was still that of one both fair and wise. Only to Lindon he did not come, for Gilgalad and Elrond doubted him and his fair seeming, and though they did not know who in truth he was, they would not admit him to that land, but elsewhere the elves received him gladly. And few among them hearkened to the messengers from Lindon, bidding them beware, for Sauron took to himself the name of Anatar, the Lord of Gifts. And they had, first, much profit from his friendship. And he said to them, Alas for the weakness of the great, for a mighty king is Gilgalad, and wise in all lore is Master Elrond, and yet they will not aid me in my labors. Can it be that they do not desire to see other lands become as blissful as their own? But wherefore should Middle-earth remain forever desolate and dark, whereas the elves could make it as fair as Eresea, nay, even as Valinor? And since you have not returned hither, as you might, I perceive that you love this Middle-earth, as do I. Is it not, then, our task to labor together for its enrichment, and for the raising of all the elven kindreds that wander here, untaught to the height of power and knowledge, which those who have are beyond the sea? It was in Eregion that the counsels of Sauron were most gladly received, for in that land the Noldor desired ever to increase the skill and subtlety of their works. Moreover, they were not at peace in their hearts, since they had refused to return to the west, and they desired both to stay in Middle-earth, which indeed they loved, and yet to enjoy the bliss of those who they had departed. Therefore they hearkened to Sauron, and they learned of him many things, for his knowledge was great. In those days the smiths of Austin Ethel surpassed all that they have contrived before, and they took thought, and they made rings of power. But Sauron guided their labors, and he was aware of all that they did, for his desire was to set a bond upon the elves and to bring them under his vigilance. Now the elves made many rings, but secretly Sauron made one ring to rule all the others, and their power was bound up in it, to be subject wholly to it, and to last only so long as to it should last. And much of the strength and will of Sauron passed into that one ring, for the power of the elven rings was very great. And that which should govern them must be a thing of surpassing potency, and Sauron forged it in the mountain of fire in the land of shadow. And while he wore the one ring, he could perceive all the things that were done by means of the lesser rings, and he could see and govern the very thoughts of those who wore them. So Galadriel is mentioned later on in the chapter of the Silmarillion called Of the Rings of Power in the Third Age. And it was just mentioned that she was the one that Celebrimbor delivered the Ring of Adamant to, but that he had to travel to Lothlorien to get her counsel. And she was simply not in Regian at that time. The sources uh, that you see on the wiki, because there are little like footnotes pointing you towards sources for the sentence that I read earlier, one points to the Council of Elrond, which doesn't mention Galadriel at all. She's not even mentioned in the Lord of the Rings until the Fellowship are already in her land, in Lothlorien. And the second source that's there uh, just points to 
the appendix notes on the second age. So it seems that the sources are backing up other claims in that section of the wiki, but no source is given for Galadriel being an Eregian and that she alone distrusted Sauron. So in the actual books, um, it seems like Galadriel never met Sauron. And of course, there would be no romance between the two. Sauron is what you would call wholly asexual. He is not interested in that sort of thing at all. And Galadriel has a husband, Celeborn, and she hates Sauron, so she wouldn't be interested in that sort of thing anyway. So in a way, the TV show was a little um, off, off base, obviously, because it was telling its own original story, but it was a little accurate in the sense that Galadriel had no interest in him. And, and you get the feeling when you're watching that scene that he's not really interested in her as a person. He's not really feeling any sort of uh, romantic or even physical affection for her. He just wants to control her because she's so great and she's so powerful and she's so wise and yada, yada, yada. Anyway, let's move on to the next question. So this is actually one of my favorites because I love when we get I, we get to answer a question about linguistics. Uh, so this person asked me, are there any words that J.R.R. Tolkien invented, such as Elevendi? So believe it or not, so what you're seeing there is a fascinating read that I got as a gift from my friend Alice last Christmas, which talks about Tolkien's time working for the Oxford English Dictionary and how it shaped his life going forward. And there are a great many notes on the words that Tolkien used and how he came about them. So having read the book uh, several times, actually, I could tell you that eleventy is a real word and it was used in the past. It was derived from the old English word edlufonte, which itself is derived from edlufon, which in modern English is eleven. So the Anglo-Saxons, because that's where Old English came from, they would count to 11 D and even 12 T. Um, and that goes back further to an older language, Old Norse. And when they counted things in Old Norse, like livestock and goods and such, um, 100, what we would call 100 was Tiu Tigur, which means 10 tens. 110 was Elifu Tigur, or 11 tens. And then 120 was Haundro, or 100. So 100 was a measurement of 120. It became common to refer to 11 T. So as the languages started evolving, 100 became 100 and 120 was a long 100. And that of course became archaic and it fell out of favor. Hobbit language is a dialect of Westron that was derived from the root of Rohanese or Rohirric, some people call it. And Tolkien represents Rohanese in his language in his books as Old English and Westron as Modern English, um, such as Hoblita being Old English, meaning Hole Dweller, and then the Modern English term there is Hobbit. So Elevendi is quite gone in our modern lexicon, but we do say often something that refers to it so you might say well if 110 to 119 are the 11 t's and 120 to 129 are the 12 t's what is 100 to 109 they were the umpties which is the root of umpteen or umpteenth as in this is the umpteenth time uh so that's an interesting little fact for you there so to answer the direct question um Tolkien in invented a lot of words uh, but the, he didn't invent English words. He only used existing English words. Just some of them are very obscure. There was one exception, though. The proper plural term of elf, in, in British English at least, is elves. And the proper plural term of dwarf in both British and American English is dwarfs. However, we now say elves and we say dwarfs because that's the way that Tolkien wanted it. And his books were very influential on how we think of these concepts of elves and dwarves. He did not invent elves and dwarves, but he made them really, really popular in fantasy literature. Some editions of The Hobbit even start with a note that dwarves is the proper plural when referring specifically to the mythical race found in his book, but otherwise it's dwarves. Okay, next question. What would happen if one of the five wizards fell in love with a woman 
or elf and married and had a family and neglected their duties without turning to evil like Saruman did. Um, well, did you know that there were there were one six of them? Uh, before they were the order of the Istari, they were the guardians, and they came to Middle Earth to protect the newly awakened elves while the Valar had a war against Melkor. Uh, they were often called the Five Guardians, and they were the same characters that later became the Astari, the Wizards. But there was a sixth, the leader, Melian. So what happened to Melian? She fell in love with an elf. She fell in love with Eluthingle, and she stayed in Middle-earth. Uh, she married him, they had a daughter named Luthien, and then after Eluthingle died, he was killed by dwarves, that was a whole mess. She went back to the West, and presumably they might still be together in the West, because He's an immortal elf, and he got killed, so that's where he goes, to the west. So, nothing would really happen. Um, Melian going off base due to love was not seen as evil or wrong or immoral in any way. It was just accepted. It was something that happened. And it sort of happened to Radagast as well. Uh, he didn't fall in love with a woman, but he fell in love with Middle-earth, with, with the, the land and the plants and the animals. So... He became too enamored with Middle-earth to take much of an interest in Sauron. So he kind of went off because of love as well. And nothing really bad happened to him. He never returned to the West, but I, I don't really think he wanted to. Okay, next question. Okay, so this one came in from the Oski Boski. Uh, who was more powerful among the elves, Feanor, Fingolfin, or Glorfindel? So this is another one where there were a lot of answers, and they all said the same thing, and they're kind of right, but kind of not really. So I'm going to get into that. The answer is Feanor, but there's a caveat in that that's so big that the answer winds up actually being Fingolfin. Um, so when people speak about Feanor as the greatest and mightiest of all the elves, uh, there is one part of the Silmarillion that they often quote and i'm going to read that part to you and pretty much everybody that answered this that got to it before i did said the same thing and i'm going to read you this section of the silmarillion for feanor was made the mightiest in all parts of body and mind in valor in endurance in beauty and understanding in skill in strength and in subtlety alike of all the children of iluvatar and a bright flame was in him the works of wonder for the glory of Arda that he might otherwise have wrought only Manwe might, in some measure, conceive. That seems pretty cut and dry, right? When you read that, there's no denying that Feanor was the greatest. Tolkien even uses the word mightiest in reference to everything. His beauty is mighty. His understanding is mighty. His subtlety is mighty. Uh, there was one other person that answered this question. They got to it before I could. And I, they said, with what I imagine as no small amount of smugness, you can't argue with the author on this one. I mean, Tolkien even said it right there. All the things that Feanor made could not even be conceived of by the Valar except for maybe Manwe himself. So let's take this out of context quote and put it back into its proper context. Let's read the entire paragraph and not just cherry pick one part. It is told that after the flight of Melkor, the Valar sat long unmoved upon the thrones in the Ring of Doom, but they were not idle, as Feanor declared in the folly of his heart. For the Valar may work many things with thought rather than with hands, and without voices and silence they may hold counsel one with another. Thus they held vigil in the night of Valinor, and their thought passed back beyond Ea, and forth to the end. Yet neither power nor wisdom assuaged their grief, and the knowing of evil in the hour of its being. And they mourned not more for the death of the trees than for the marring of Feanor, of works of Melkor, one of the most evil. For Feanor was made the mightiest in all parts of body and mind, in valor and endurance and beauty and understanding and skill and strength and in subtlety alike, of all the children of Iluvatar, and a bright flame was in him. The works of wonder for the glory of Arda that he might otherwise have wrought, only Manwe might in some measure conceive. So when you put it into context like that, Feanor has become much like Melkor in a way. He hates Melkor. Melkor, though, was not evil in the beginning, and he was created 
as the mightiest of the Ainur. Even his name means he who arises with might. But he had diminished through evil. He spent himself on himself, as Hurun put it, and over time he became less and less mighty. Melkor goes from being able to stand against the other 14 Valar united to being so diminished that he's cowered by Eanwa and a host of elves. The Valar, in their Ring of Doom, do not consider the destruction of the two trees as being the worst thing that Melkor has done. They don't consider the marring of the land itself to be the worst thing that Melkor has done. They consider the marring of Feanor to be the worst thing that he's done. He was created to be the mightiest, and not just in strength, but in every quality that an elf can have. And Melkor ruined him. And he did this with just words. It's hard to look at Feanor's actions after this and see any subtlety or see any understanding in them. He was unsubtle. He did not understand the ways of the Valar, who do many things with thought rather than hands and without voices and silence. He saw them sitting and presumed that they were idle and that they would do nothing about Melkor, who he now called Morgoth. He assumed that Morgoth was going to get away with everything because he was one of them. He was a Vala. And why did he think this? Because Morgoth put it in his head earlier that he was a Vala. So Feanor, like Morgoth himself, wound up diminished. He lost his subtlety. He lost his understanding. And all of the strength and endurance would not save him from the Balrogs. And Nama Mandos, shortly after the quote that I read, states, before too long, Feanor will come to him. Compare him to Fingolfin. He's kinder, he's more understanding, he has a greater understanding of subtlety, who, with a sword to his throat, proclaimed that you are my half-brother by blood, but my full brother in my heart. He understood that there could be no greater sin than kinslaying, and he tried to avoid this elf-on-elf -elf conflict that Feanor was instigating as much as he could. He was an exile who went into the west, he abjured the use of stolen ships, and he took the long path across the grinding ice, who in the end fought toe-to-toe -to -toe with Morgoth, and though he died, he grievously wounded the Dark Lord eight times, diminishing him further than he had been, and whose eyes shone like the Valar, and those that saw him in his full wrath thought that he was an incarnate form of Aroma. So Feanor was created to be the greatest, but in his arrogance and his impatience became evil like Morgoth even as he hated Morgoth, and thus he became diminished. He was marred like Middle-earth. And in the end, out of the three, Fingolfin was the greatest. And I, I didn't speak much about Glorfindel there. He was very powerful in the Third Age after being gifted additional angelic powers by Manwa, the other side of the coin being the, his old nemesis, the Witch King, uh, of Agmar being given d extra demonic powers by Sauron. But in the first age, he was just an exceptional elf. He wasn't on that same kind of level that Feanor and Fingolfin were. Okay, last question. And this one also comes in from the Oski Boski, who asks, When was Sauron the closest at reclaiming the One Ring? I mean, both with distance and opportunity. So it was just a few moments before the One Ring was destroyed. That's the answer there. When Frodo reached... Samoth Nauer, he claimed the ring as his own, which is understandable. No one could resist it at this point. The One Ring was at the very seat of its power, and Frodo was at the very end of his endurance. He had already performed a miracle by getting the ring there without Sauron noticing. It, this was helped, of course, by the actions of, of Sam, uh, by Gandalf, Aragorn, Imrahil at the Black Gate, uh, but now Sauron noticed. It's one thing to wear the ring. It's another thing to use the ring's power. But to use the ring's power in his own domain at the seat of the ring's power and to claim it as your own? And so very close to the Dark Tower. This was not going to escape his notice. The Nazgul, who were fighting at the Black Gate, were called back to intercept whoever it was that was mucking around with Sauron's power 
at Orodruin, and if not for the intervention of Gollum, they would have arrived, they would have bowed to Frodo, and they would have called him the Lord of the Rings. They would bring him to his tower, and of course Sauron would be waiting, and he would just take the ring off of Frodo, uh, no problem there, by force, and then he would then be at a level of power that the current state of Middle-earth's heroes could not stand against, and Frodo and Sam would be dead. Uh, so that's why Gollum was important. Um, if he wasn't there, Sauron would have gotten the ring in a matter of mere minutes. This was the closest that he came to recovering it. So anyway, guys, that was all the questions that you had for me this week, or at least all the ones that I chose for the video. And if you got all the way through this video and you haven't subscribed yet, why not just tickle the subscribe button? It couldn't hurt. I mean, you got through this whole video, right? Um, and of course, if you want to continue to support me in a bigger way, consider membership. It doesn't cost all that much. You will get to see all the videos early. And we're going to have our shout out to our current members right now, which we're putting on the screen. Only one member so far, but we thank you, of course, and we hope to get more. And we'll see you guys next time.